Welcome to Diffused Congruence. This is episode 18 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me, as always, is Parvez Ahmed. Welcome back, good listeners. So we have a very exciting guest this time. I'm I'm ecstatic to be able to present this conversation uh, to you because this is a conversation I've been hoping to have since, gosh, before we even started doing this show. Really. Correct. Uh, so, so top of our wish list, t- very top. Yeah. So, so we're we're very excited to uh, be able to share our conversation with Imam Zaid Shaker. By by way of some context, Imam Zaid Shaker is a Muslim American scholar. He's a public speaker and author. He's also co-founder with Hamza Yusuf and Hatim Bezian, uh, and chairman of the board and senior faculty member of Zaytuna College in Berkeley, California. He teaches courses on Arabic law, history, and Islamic spirituality. And we're, we're recording this episode actually the morning after the big Zaytuna College dinner where it was announced that, that uh, the school has been accredited. So it'll be the first fully accredited Muslim school uh, in the Muslim United College. States. Muslim College, excuse me, in, in the United States. So uh, it's a big deal. So, so that's the context in which we entered our conversation with Imam Zayt. And, and by the way, it's worth pointing out that you will hear a slight um in the background, and and that hum, it's it's room tone, it's 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 ambience, it's to make you feel like you're there with us, and it's actually the fan that we didn't know how to turn off until uh, partway through the conversation. So so bear with us on that. So without any further ado, here is Imam Zaid Shaker. So Imam Zaid, thank you so much for for joining us, taking the time to sit with us. Alhamdulillah, it's a great honor to be on such a prestigious podcast. <laughs> It, it just got all the more prestigious. I know, just by, just by, by, you, by you saying that. By virtue yeah. of having you and having you say that. Now, now this is the the timing of our conversation is 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 auspicious. Couldn't be more timely. It, it really couldn't. <laughs> we're, we're we're sitting in the Santa Clara Marriott the morning after the Zaytuna banquet, where a major announcement was made. As Zaytuna College has become the first uh, uh, accredited Muslim college in America. This is a, an extremely big announcement. It's a big deal. And we feel like we don't want to bury the lead. We want to start right out by talking about Zaytuna College. What is its mission? What is it about? And and um, what 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 led to its uh, inception? Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Bismillah rahim Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. I think that's a very, very uh, good place to start. As you mentioned, we're here in the Marriott, where it really was a very historic, uh, monumental momentous, uh, auspicious occasion last night. I run out of adjectives just <laughs> thinking about it. And uh, alhamdulillah, uh, it, it's, it's the culmination of a lot of work, a lot of people. Allah really, Tala really brought a really good team together. Uh, and Sheikh Hamza, the president of the college, uh, who's been working with Zaytuna before it was a college, as an institute, uh, really put his uh, life into it. And uh, I was blessed to come out here in 2003 to work uh, with Zaytuna. And we started a a pilot program. Uh, Five students uh, gave four years of their life. Uh, They didn't receive a a degree. It was an experimental phase. We would experiment with curriculum, workload, appropriate blend of the East and the West and uh, through all of that uh, we settled on the idea that we needed to be a formal college, a liberal arts college, a Muslim liberal arts college. This is a novel idea mm-hmm. which again required a lot of work and then Allah Ta'ala just brought the people that we needed at the proper time to really move this uh, from idea to reality. And uh, so last night was the culmination of that process. And uh, I think it really testifies to the maturation of our community, that we're now a community moving beyond uh, the masjid and then masjid-based education. So the halakha, which is very important, don't get me wrong, or the Sunday school, or the other institutions that are very closely affiliated with the masjid into the mainstream of American education. And I think by making that move, we have a platform whereby we can bring our values and we can bring our voice and we can bring our views into the mainstream to be discussed and to be amplified 
And I'll say this uh, in conclusion to this question, and I'm sure we can follow up more in the context of other questions, that uh, as Muslims, we have very talented individuals. We have individuals who are multilingual. We have individuals who have multiple PhDs. We, we have very talented individuals, but a lot of times the strength and the talent of the individuals is lost owing to the weakness of our institutions. We don't have the institutional megaphone to magnify the voice of that individual or those individuals. So I think it's, it's a milestone that we not only have been able to develop this college, but to develop it to a, a level and a degree that a peer review body such as the Western Association of Schools and Colleges, the WASC, will look at it and say, by the standards we've established, this college is creditable. And it stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with other institutions, maybe not in scale, but in terms of quality of education. So that's fantastic. Well, and, and I mean, I think in, in a lot of ways it feels like your journey from from becoming Muslim to this point, it's almost like there's a sweep and an arc to that narrative. And I feel like there's there's uh, so, there's a rich vein there that I'd love to get into. Starting with uh, how, how did how did you come to Islam? I mean, what was what was the the impetus behind the beginning of that journey? Oh, okay. Well, since you asked, I'll try to make a very long story fairly short. I won't say short, fairly short. I'll try to uh, just give my story in a nutshell, but it's a coconut shell, <laughs> not a peanut shell. So it's a big nutshell. In any case, you know, as I was moving through my high school years, I was in the state of Connecticut in a city called New Britain, called Hard Hidden New Britain. And most Connecticut cities, if you're familiar with the demographics of Connecticut cities, Usually you'll have a, an Italian section, you'll have African American and Puerto Rican section, and uh, some cities you'll have unique populations. In New Britain we had a, a Polish, a very large Polish community. And uh, then when you get out of the cities, it's almost all white. So vanilla suburbs, as they say. And the inner city areas such as Hartford and Bridgeport, uh, primarily New Haven, can be very rough places and, uh, uh, and the surrounding suburbs generally very quiet places. Hartford historically has had the greatest disparity between the poverty of the inner city uh, Areas and the wealth of the adjacent suburb between Hartford and West Hartford, that disparity is greater than anywhere in the world, uh, in the country rather. Right. You can literally go from uh, five blocks and it's like you left one world and went into another, like you went into some sort of, uh, I wouldn't say time warp, place warp machine, and you just bam, you're from just hardcore ghetto into literally mansions and nice lawns and no noise. So in any case, you know, I grew up in a housing project called Pinnacle Heights, which has since been uh, demolished mm. uh, as a very large housing project. There were others in New Britain. We had Corbin Heights, we had Malakowski Circle, and then we had Mount Pleasant. These were the main housing projects. And they were predominantly African American and Puerto Rican. So, in any case, uh, growing up in those projects, I witnessed uh, there was a very happy childhood when you're young. You don't notice things, you're just hanging out with your friends and very sports centered uh, city, you're just playing whatever sports in the season baseball all day, football all day, getting your clothes ripped up, driving your mother crazy basketball all day mm. uh, so the sports centered and so we generally stayed out of trouble because of our involvement with sports but and you see a lot of good people wholesome people hard-working people trying to make a living uh, from day to day trying to raise their families trying to do the right thing 
But you also see some of the negative things, the yeah. alcoholism, the drugs, single parent homes, and then all of the uh, uh, implications of those things in terms of the, the social environment. So when I was moving into my latter high school years, I began to, to examine some of the more negative things and ask myself, how can I contribute to a change? What is it going to help, going to take rather, to change these conditions? Mm. And that really started me thinking just about social change. And uh, simultaneously, I began to develop a, a series of religious questions concerning who is God, uh, what is the nature of God, what should be the proper relationship between humans and their creator, so these sort of, sort of uh, questions, what is the purpose of all this? And so these sort of questions, they started to surface and uh, they sort of led me to begin to examine alternative ways of thought, alternative ideas, alternative religion, mm -hmm. religions. I was raised in a Baptist family, uh, but you know, I went to church on Christmas and Easter, but I wouldn't say I believed in God, but I wouldn't say I was overtly or, or extraordinarily religious right. to any significant degree. So in any case, as I began to examine those things, I eventually rejected religion and came to believe that the change to the condition of the poor people would be the Marxist revolution, communist revolution, that the exploitation of the uh, bourgeoisie over the proletariat would lead to the expanding misery of the bourgeoisie and the growing concentration of capital and the monopoly or the expanding misery of the proletariat and the yeah. concentration of capital and monopolies, the shrinking uh, bourgeoisie and eventually this inequity and the masses of impoverished, exploited workers will rise up against the small elite and overthrow them and usher in a classless society and not only will we have economic justice from each according to his means to each according to his needs but we all have, so have human liberation having solved the problem of alienation which lies in separating the human being from the product of their labor mm -hmm. which is usurped by the capitalists right. and so you know I got my violin and Right. Utopianism, right? Yeah, and so I yeah. drank the Kool Aid, yeah. and uh, we're also talking. This is probably what in the uh, in the sixties. This is no. This okay. is the mid. This is the uh, early seventies. Early seventies. Okay. So, so I'm, I graduated high school in nineteen seventy four. So this is nineteen seventy three, seventy four. Towards the so, end so you're a school. teenager right now. You're in yeah, your... I'm a teenager. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And and, uh, and uh, does how about. I mean, does the civil rights struggle and Malcolm, you know, Martin, did, were they just sort of on the radar? Uh, uh, most, most definitely. My okay. mother was an activist and okay. a writer. Mm. And so she would write about different issues, racial inequality and justices, uh, and sometimes very controversial ways, which we would, she would get hate mail from the Ku Klux Klan and the Nazi Party and... She would share that with us, let us know okay. what kind of world we're, we're going into. Right. And, uh, and then in high school, I mean, the Black Panthers in New Haven, Connecticut, is sort of a sister city with Oakland. Right. The Bobby Seale trial was there. That's right. And so Connecticut, that sort of, the right. Panthers had a pretty high profile. So young folks growing up, especially in the inner city areas, were exposed to some of that thought. The Puerto Ricans, the young lords, and other groups were, were very prominent. And so we had that kind of consciousness just as a background factor. Mm. Uh, but once I got involved with the communist uh, thought, with communist thought, really, and started studying mm -hmm. their literature, you know, I came very quickly to realize that there was a big deficiency and that it didn't account for first causes. Like if the moving force of history was the thesis, uh, antithesis, synthesis, going to the contradictions embedded in the theses, uh, where did this first thesis come from? What is the, what is the uh, first cause of things? And not getting an answer, I began to really re-examine certain issues and that led me back 
to uh, the, uh, to theism, believing in God. There has to be a God because there has to be a first cause mm. who created something from nothing. There has to be a a an animator, one who gave life to the inanimate. There has to be to to propose that in the vastness of space, the nothingness of space, the void of space, something can just poop spontaneously appear is impossible. And then to suppose that the most fundamental basic molecular structure or just an atom or whatever it was to take on the properties of life, to be able to grow and expand, to reproduce is another possibility as I saw it. And then to propose uh, and of course these ideas have been challenged I would say unsuccessfully but at the time this was my thinking and then the third impossibility that so we suppose for the sake of argument boop, something popped into being from nothing and we suppose for the sake of argument it gained the properties of life and then how did it evolve into all of this with no arranger nothing we know every structured aspect of our existence has an arranger mm -hmm. And we're in a beautiful room. This is a radio uh, podcast, so folks can't see it. But we, we don't come into this room and suppose the lamp put itself over there and the matching lamp put itself over there. And they position themselves in a balanced way at the ends of the mirror with the mirror in the window. And then the plant at the bottom of the mirror, right in the center, to complete the arrangement... It all did it itself. No, when we see structure, yeah. we understand there's an arranger who orchestrated that structure. And so when I reflected on those things, I said, there has to be, to myself, there has to be a God. Right. And so I set out once again to try to know who God is and what God demands of his servants mm -hmm. and what are our obligations to our creator, etc. So those kind of questions pushed me to examining religion again. I looked into Christianity once again and I, I just found the answers weren't there. And this is my personal experience. I was involved in transcendental meditation for a couple years, uh, meditating and studying the teachings of the Maharishi. And eventually I just, I was doing really good. I was at, they, they say, after you re reach a point, you can levitate. You can actually <laughs> lift off from the ground. You were almost there. I was getting close to lift off. <laughs> okay. I'm telling you. But the more I got yeah. into it, I still had these social concerns. And mm. to me, it just seemed a very selfish approach to life. That, you know, I'm meditating, I'm feeling good, but I'm not doing anything to help the less fortunate members of society. And so it's right at that point where I'm a couple years in and I've been reflecting on these various things and I've come out of the Marxist experience that I got a book on Islam. Mm. Islam in focus. Ah, Muhammad Abdul Ati. Of course. And uh, I read that I said, this is it. My questions, the, my theological questions were answered. My social questions were answered and having studied Marxism as I said for a while when the Marxists encountered a crisis in terms of their thought for example politically the revolution wasn't happening so you have people like Karl Kautsky and uh, Bernstein and others who came up with the document the, the doctrine rather the idea of uh, uh, social democratic socialism I'm sorry, democratic socialism. Um, and you can see that this didn't flow from the original thesis, which change isn't going to be affected in parliament. Change is going to be affected through the revolution. Mm -hmm. And so it was incongruous with the original thesis. When the crisis of humanism, and you saw the development of a humanistic Marxist tradition in Western Europe, was sometimes referred to as European uh, Marxism, again, you can see the, the pieces, the gears didn't quite mesh. Mm. So you're trying to bring the economic with the political, with the, uh, the, the spiritual to a certain extent, and the gears didn't mesh, whereas, or the, the humanistic. 
In Islam, the gears, they all fit the economic, the political, the social, the cultural, all the gears meshed. And that alone just led me to say, this cannot be from a human being. Because every effort by a human being to construct an integrated system mm -hmm. like Islam, the gears just didn't quite mesh. But here, everything meshed. Everything fit in uh, seamlessly right. with everything else, the social, the political, the cultural, the religious, the theological. And so, you know, shortly thereafter, I became a Muslim and I lived happily ever after and rolled off into the sunset of life <laughs> to enjoy the whatever was beyond the next ridge. Right. So, so, so you were you were how old when you uh, yeah. embraced Islam? I was 20 years old. In college? No, I was in the Air Force. Ah, that's right. right. I was in the Air Force. It was during that process, my mother had passed away. I was in college, but she passed away during my first year of college. And uh, our, our flat, I guess they say, they don't use that in America, apartment and the projects. Yeah. My sister, who was married and had two babies and was struggling, and since that was sort of rent control, she moved in with her family. And I being, she was the oldest, being the second oldest, okay. and not wanting to see my younger siblings out in the street, I moved out. And so it was during that period of just kind of drifting around, being to a certain extent, at certain times, sort of uh, homeless, literally, I began to contemplate the military mm -hmm. as as they say, the poverty draft. I could get four, three square meals, a roof over my head, and I could get an education, get my education paid for. Right. So to me, that was a pretty good deal. That's right. And uh, so I ended up going in the Air Force, and it was during my stint in the Air Force that this process started before I went in, but it culminated. So I actually accepted Islam. Uh, it culminated during my time in the Air Force, so I accepted Islam in the Air Force. Up until this time, I mean, your interaction with the with Muslims or the Muslim community is almost nil? Or? It's nil. Yeah. I met a few uh, converts in, in the, the Air Force. In the Air Force, okay. That's how I got the book, Islam in Focus. Got and it. then we had a little group. But I'll tell you, until I went to Syria and studied uh, much... Uh, my the focus of my life as a Muslim centered around converts, new Muslims, and non-Muslims. Mm -hmm. That was it until I came back. Then I got wrapped up more with the immigrant community. Right. So well, we're getting and, a little ahead. I, I mean, I'd, I'd love for you to to illustrate a little bit for because I think for for a lot of the people listening to this show, and certainly for 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 myself as as a member of the immigrant community, like we. I do anyway. I take for granted the idea that there is a place to pray, you know, almost anywhere, and there's a community almost anywhere. I mean, what was the Muslim community like at the time that you came into the fold? Because you're also not coming in vis-a-vis -vis the Nation of Islam, where there is, where there are some sure. social uh, institutions in place. You're coming in like into the mainstream community as it were. Quote, yeah, alhamdulillah. Yeah. Well, I'm coming into the community of Imam Warfidin Muhammad initially. You are? Oh, okay, okay. Because the brothers who, so this is 1977. Right. Uh, By then. Elijah Muhammad had passed away in 1975. That's right. Imam W.D. Muhammad took the reins of the organization. And he was assisted by uh, Minister Farrakhan, who had his orthodox phase known as Abdul Halim Farrakhan until 1977 when he re went back to the to the uh, Teach original teachings of the nation of Islam so in any case okay. that was pretty much my exposure and we were in uh, Bossier City, Louisiana at Barksdale Air Force Base right across the Red River was Shreveport uh -huh. and they had uh, a community of followers of the Imam Warfid bin Muhammad there, so we were involved with that particular community Got for it. the first couple years of my Muslim okay. life. We've had uh, Imam uh, Abu Qadir on on the show. Uh, this was last year. We talked to great length about the about the legacy. Of yeah, Muhammad. it was a great conversation. Yeah, Imam, yeah, Imam W D Muhammad. So, I think uh, Imam yeah. W D Muhammad, his legacy will 
Uh, I think he's underappreciated, right. definitely understudied, and the wisdom that he displayed uh, will be increasingly appreciated as time goes on. I'm absolutely confident of that. But I, I kind of yeah. went beyond that. Okay. I, I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, and okay. then just reading that and, and getting some of the kind of backstory of the Nation of Islam through that, uh-huh. I kind of got disenchanted, and, and so I moved more towards a Sunni reality, okay. so the African-American inner city Sunni Muslim, which had communities, and then this again is something on their study, you had communities in Cleveland and Pittsburgh, <laughs> Uh, you had uh, Philadelphia, in, uh, Sheikh Wali Akram, right. Philadelphia. Uh, in the 60s, you had the Dar al right. uh, movement beginning. You had the Mosque of uh, Islamic Brothers, Imam Tawfiq, mm-hmm. now led by Imam Talib Abdul Rashid. Right. You had uh, uh, Sheikh Daoud Faisal and Mother Khadija throughout the 40s, the 50s, 60s. Yeah. Uh, so you you had uh, Isildeen Village outside of Philadelphia. You had a lot of Sunni Muslim, and in Detroit, you had also a, a variety of movements. So you had a, a presence for Sunni Islam, right within and the Black American community, within the African American yeah. community, and then amongst immigrants, you yeah. had the Mother Mosque in in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Yeah. You had the various Masajid in Michigan and Dearborn uh, and Detroit sure. area in yeah. Michigan. Uh, you had the Yemenis in Hamtramck, Michigan, the Bengalis. You had uh, the Iraqis, the Lebanese, Shia also in Dearborn. Uh, the Dearborn area. So, and you had, you had uh, Dusay Muhammad Ali, 1926, joining with Sheikh Khalil uh, Bazi and others to form the Universal Islamic Society. It's a multiracial, multi-sectarian, if you will, uh, Muslim movement in Detroit, Michigan. So you had a lot happening in the more orthodox realm that's, mm-hmm. again, it's understudy, understudy right. that provided communities in different parts of the country. Right. It's what Dr. Niang sort of talks about, the, the Webian... Uh, track and then the Elijian track. I think he calls it in his in his, in his book Islam in the United States. Okay, you could yeah. say that to a certain extent. Yeah. I think the Webian track would still be kind of a non-immigrant track. Right, that's what I mean. Is is but but still closer but to you had or, or, these orthodox new immigrant realities. You okay. had the Ahmadiyyas. Ahmadiyyas were right. Yeah, uh, Mufti Muhammad Sadiq, and and so you you had a lot happening. Right, and of course by the 1970s, I mean that's where my parents' story starts in this country. So. That influx post yeah, 1965 is, is, is already starting. It's certainly there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you talk about graduating in 1974. Uh, I was born in 1974. So. <laughs> it was a very good year. <laughs> it was. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know I was in such a good company in terms of uh, yeah people starting a new phase. <laughs> uh, so then now uh, you, uh, you're out of the Air Force, or no? So you're seeing, you, you you start moving away from that community of right. Muhammad, w. Muhammad into what you know. I'm still in the Air Force at right. this point, okay. Okay. but I tried to get out, in fact, because I didn't think Muslims could serve in the military because mm. the Muhammad Ali experience, which That's has right. just come to a head in 1972 with his vindication by the Supreme Court. Can you can you elaborate on that for us? And, and so, you know, being sort of those are your Islamic points of reference, Muhammad Ali resisting the draft, I uh, ain't got no quarrel with them Viet Cong. And so I become Muslim, I'm in the military, my first thought, I have to get out. And so I go to the chaplain and try to get out as a conscious, conscientious objector. And he says, well, we're not fighting a war. So how can you object to a war when we're not fighting anyone? So I said, okay, then send me to a Muslim country. So they happily obliged and sent me to Turkey before I changed my mind. <laughs> because even though Turkey was uh, definitely secularized, and this was probably the the late seventies or one of the uh, low points in terms of the secularization sure. of Turkey, but still, it was a Muslim society. So generally, no smoking, no drinking, no discotheques and nightclubs, and 
So no, no one wanted to, wanted to go there. You know, all the GIs wanted to go to the Philippines, <laughs> right, and Thailand, yeah. and Japan, right. and Germany. You lived the life, chased the girls, go from bounce from party to party. And here's this guy. He was volunteering to go to Turkey. So they shipped Austere, me out yeah. as soon as the, yeah. as soon as they could before I changed my mind. Got so it. there I I became uh, very much involved with uh, local Turkey Hanafi Nakshibandi followers of Erbakan because uh, you know so I never knew you, that's where you used to wow you, I didn't know you spent time in Turkey there yeah I spent two and a half years in Turkey my last two and a half years of my stint in the Air Force oh, were in Turkey. Turkey Okay. and so we, we got uh, we were hanging out with uh, Nejmuddin Erbakan's followers fascinating and uh they were in the throes of really, uh, especially after the Iranian Revolution in 1979, and I was there. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and uh, it, was, it was an amazing period. And I even mentioned of Islam. Dawah, yeah, Dawah activity, activity right. going out into the countryside. We were in Injilik, which is adjacent to the city of Adana, mm -hmm. which is one of the five largest cities in Turkey. And uh, we would go with these. Uh, followers of Erbakan to the countryside, watch Dawa go to some of their rallies. Uh, so it was, it was really exciting time. I made Hajj from Turkey on the bus and by car, just renting a car, riding the bus with the Turks. Uh, the, so the bigger point is, though, yeah. that kind of pulled me involvement, right. not being in the States, and with the community of the followers of Malwarth Muhammad, now I'm in Turkey with Turkish Muslims. And so that kind of weaned me away from the community. Uh, and then I got out of the Air Force, I came back uh, to the States and settled in Washington, D.C. for a few years. I did, my, uh, I did two years of college in the Air Force, and then I did two years at American University in Washington, D.C. to get my B.A. American. I didn't know that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, Amer I'm an American eagle. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I hope I I don't end up singing bye bye Miss American Pie. <laughs> Drove my Chevy to, to the, the levee, but the, the levee, levee was, was dry. Right. <laughs> and I won't tell you what those good old boys were drinking. That's right. They're Muslim. They are. But it wasn't orange juice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and then I did well, so. graduate school at Rutgers University yeah, in New Jersey. That's where I thought, right. And, uh, Newark or Camden? Newark. Newark. Oh, no, no, New Brunswick. At that time, oh, yeah, okay, New, New Brunswick. The main campus the main in campus. New Brunswick. But I've, I've, we spent a lot of time in Newark, mm. and I visited Camden, I think. Most this is political before. science that you... I did political science. I did my MA in political science. And uh, after that, I went to Egypt for uh, a year to study Arabic. Okay. I said, you know, I gave all this time studying what they wanted me to study. Now I'm going to study something beneficial for my dean. Mm -hmm. So I went to Egypt and studied Arabic uh, for about 11 months. Mm -hmm. Came back to the States, uh, returned home to New Haven, Connecticut. Not New Britain, but my several of, of my brothers and sisters, my siblings have moved to New Haven. So... I moved to New Haven, and there we started a masjid, Masjid al Islam, okay. uh, just for dawah and outreach. That was the whole focus of that. that. And alhamdulillah, we, we were outreaching and we were making dawah. And uh, mashallah, it was a very time, it was a period of serious activism. We were active in the schools. Uh, our efforts were instrumental in getting drug free zones around the schools. We started patrols and the housing projects to cut down on the drug trafficking and, and a couple of the housing projects mm. there in New Haven and then a couple of the really bad streets where Muslims live. We, we shut it down, literally. Uh, we were involved with the after-school programs and, and this, they had a program for uh, children of working mothers. They would stay in the school till 5 o'clock. And so from 2.30 to 5, they would bring in various community groups to teach things. And so we had people from the Masjid teaching Arabic. I actually taught Arabic in the Helen Grant School to second graders in New Haven, Connecticut. Wow. 
and uh, we had uh, brothers going into the timeout room to counsel uh, unruly young folks. Right. One of the brothers was teaching martial arts, mm. Hassan Abdullah. So, uh, alhamdulillah, it was, a, it was a very good time. Mm. It reminds me of, like, so the Imam Siraj and the work that they were doing in Bed-Stuy. It was our inspiration. Brooklyn. And oh, in okay. fact, Imam Siraj, they, they actually helped us a lot. Oh, okay. We the world. We were coordinating. We support okay. the effort, and they supported us. One of the reasons very I ask, yeah, okay. Deep and rich ways. Okay. And so then... Um, uh, you are familiar with Sheikh Hamza? You've met Sheikh Hamza up until that point? Uh, not at that point. Okay. Uh, so we're, we're, we're into, in, I mean, this is what, the, the mid-80s now? No? Late-80s. Late-80s, yeah, yeah. Late-80s, and we're moving into the 90s. Right. Okay. That's what That's pretty good, though, for <laughs> yeah. you no know, overt right. time references. <laughs> so I, did, I didn't yeah. meet Sheikh Hamza until 1993 at oh, the wow. Muslim Power which was a oh, yeah, predecessor agree. of the Dean Intensives right. at ABQ, New Mexico. It's fascinating. We were just talking about ABQ yesterday. Actually, yeah. I met Sheikh Hamza a year before uh-huh. at the, Ma- the Maya Conference, Muslim Arab Youth Association in to- Detroit. Okay. And so Chicago, we, we were on a panel uh-huh. together, uh-huh. and just we crossed paths as he did his thing mm-hmm. and then left. And I was coming for the next session, and we got to talk briefly uh, but I didn't really... He must have just himself been back because he comes back, what, the early 90s, back from Mauritania, right? Or from his travels abroad. And yeah, he was before. just back and yeah. getting known. It's like, Correct. Oh, this guy is Arabic, he knows poetry, he knows the Hadith right. and the Quran, and yeah. he can talk to Martians. <laughs> he was like Muhammad Ali. Yeah, man, there's this white guy. And he could <laughs> climb mountains, swim oceans, wrestle alligators, tackle wells. He handcuffed thunder and threw lightning in jail. He's a bad man. Like they were talking about Muhammad Ali. They were right. talking about Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Uh-huh. And yeah. so in any case, so I met yeah. Sheikh Hamza. We passed by then, but right. the next year I went to the Muslim powwow. Okay. So I was very yeah, hesitant, right. hesitant to go because I was coming out of like kind of a salafi kind of background, and the Muslim powwow were these Sufi deviants. Hmm. So it actually took me a, a couple years to finally go there. So that's fascinating. I was so like, man, you I'll get labeled. You the Naqshbandi exposure in Turkey. Right. And so when we were in New Brunswick, in like, New, Brunswick uh-huh. New Jersey, okay. there was an individual, I won't say his name, right. who had been influenced by a, a very influential Salafi da'i who ends up burning out and maybe leaving Islam, divorcing his wife. Not the brother who was the one who brought it to me, but the one who was teaching him. Right. And so he likes everything, Hanafi, that's all yeah, bid'ah, right. madhabs, and, and so... We're and still late 80s or early 90s? This, right now, we're, we're in... Uh, we're in... For that transition, yeah. this is the mid-80s. Okay. Mid-80s. So I'm in New Brunswick, New Jersey, going to graduate school. This uh, individual is also... He's doing his uh, undergraduate, and then he goes to the University of Chicago to study with Fazl Rahman. Fazl Rahman passes away after his first year, so I don't think he ever finished his PhD. So in any case, but he's very influential, and so he kind of got us into Salafism, but we were very suspicious because of... uh, after the Iranian Revolution, we have been very sympathetic to that, and mm-hmm. we used to call the Saudi Arabia Taghuti Arabia, <laughs> the, the Taghut, mm. and that you're supposed to reject. We mean yakfur but the Taghut wa yu'min billah. False gods. Yuri duna in yatahakamu illa Taghut. They right. want to take their readings from the yeah. Taghut, from the false gods. So, right. so you have this kind of crazy mix of the the Hanafi. Naqshibendi, no, pro Iranian. <laughs> wow. Salafi. Now turning Salafi. <laughs> turning Salafi. And then. Uh, yeah. Was, and, yeah, so. I, I think but we were never uh, in firmly in, in of yeah. any of it. Because even when we were in the Salafi thing, our whole master, we take spiritual retreats. Okay. And we go to this. Uh, 
uh, uh, Christian camp. We were rented out. I, I, I had started working in the Hemden, Connecticut Welfare Department. I was the welfare coordinator. And we would go there Friday night, all day Saturday to Sunday afternoon. We'd make vicar and we read uh, a book on the preparing for the last day. That was our, we just go each time and reread it from cover to cover. Mm. And we make vicar and we pray to Hajjud. So we called it our spiritual retreat. But mm. the point you were making vicar in groups and we were, right. we were bad Salafis. That's right. I was going to say, sir. Well, I, I'm wondering, you know, for, for the sake of our broader audience yeah, that might right. not know these distinctions, I was wondering if you can. Elaborate on what what is Salafism? What is Sufism? How how are these different approaches? Because I think for, for many people listening to the show, they've heard these terms, but they they don't understand. Right. I think you, you know the Hanafi school and the Naqshbandi Tariqa and other Salaf. These are the products of uh, Muslim traditional Muslim societies, and in a nutshell, these are just ways that Muslims creatively asked questions that will arise when human beings try to implement a divine revelation in human society and in history. So you're trying to live this revelation. And and so theological questions arise, legal questions arise. And so methabs, the Hanafi methab being one, is a, a set of principles and rules that allow you to answer the legal questions that arise because the hadith doesn't cover everything. There, there are gaps. How do you fill in those gaps? So the method perform, and then the things that are there in the hadith or in what's been transmitted from down from the sahaba and uh, etc. How do you integrate all those various fragments in some instances into coherent acts of worship? into coherent systems of life mm-hmm. to govern your economic life. And that's the ijtihad of the mujtahidun. Mm-hmm. Like Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, Imam al-Shafi, rahimahullah, Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, Imam uh, Malik, rahimahullah, those whose schools are their paradigm mm-hmm. for sorting through this material and making sense out of it, passed away, such as al awzai or Laith bin Sa'ad, or Sufyan uh, al-Thawri, or many others, Imam uh, uh, Abu Jarir al-Tabari, and many others. So uh, a madhab is a, a set of principles, legal principles, uh, legal uh, like thinkings, uh, legal thought that allows you to integrate the various source material from the Qur'an, from the Hadith, from the sayings of the Sahaba, into a coherent system of worship. And the same thing in terms of spiritual life. You know, how do you develop focused spiritual practices, again, from that raw material and from the insights of those who were able to succeed spirit- spiritually? So the... Sufism that becomes an effort to systematically approach those spiritual questions. How does one? Allah Taala mentions in the Quran, "Yom la yanfur malu wa la banun illa man atta Allah bi qalbin salim." On a day, no amount of children, welfare children, will be of any benefit. Only the only one benefited is the one coming before Allah with an upright heart. How do you rectify your heart? How do you render it? Upright. Actions are based on their intentions. How do you develop purity in your intention if you find your intention is faulty? Uh, so the, the, the people of Tasawwuf tried to develop systematic approaches and practices to answer those questions. That's what Salafism would reject that tr- the the, the uh, Tradition that developed around those institutions and say, no, we have to go back to the original teachings of the Quran, the, the Prophet, the Quran, and the Prophet وسلم, and his authenticated statements and what's in the Quran. That becomes the basis for 
our religious practice, that becomes the basis for our spiritual practice, and all of these uh, uh, paradigms, if you will, that were put in place and introduced by the scholars to answer very pertinent theological, spiritual, uh, legal questions, that's all, uh, those are unacceptable accretions that were added to the religion. So in a, in a very quick, cursory way, that's what we mean by methab, Sufism, Hanafi being a, a methab, a school, legal school, uh, Salafism, in a nutshell, that's what we mean by so, those I mean, terms. You're, you're talking about a pretty fundamentally different approach to, to uh, the, you know, the practice of Islam. I, I would say it's deeper than that. I would say a fundamentally different approach, not only to the practice of Islam, but how we see Islam. Okay. Because I think one, once we reject the, the human uh, effort mm -hmm. to understand, to practice, to apply the religion then essentially we're removing any sort of civilizational, civilizing in the sense of contributing to the ongoing march of human civilization right. from Islam. And saying basically we're going to go back to a point and we're going to build a society in the absence of these systems that our scholars put into place. And so the same questions come up, but now we don't have the mechanisms to answer them. Because we're rejecting all the scholars. Because we're rejecting exactly the, the, human, the tools that our scholars gave us to uh, answer those questions in a meaningful, civilized, civilizing way. Civilizing in a way that contributes to the ongoing march of human civilization because civilization is cumulative and for knowledge to accumulate and that's the whole basis of Thomas Kuhn's uh, structure of scientific revolutions and we get the idea of a paradigm from that book that you need this paradigm paradigmatic structure for knowledge to accumulate mm -hmm. and so once we take that away we're constantly just reinventing the wheel or we're, we're constantly uh, faced with issues and questions we don't have the tools to answer. And I think that's one of the problems that we see today in many parts of the Muslim world. Do, do you see a linkage between, between that, that worldview and, for example, things like ISIS, and et cetera? You know, I don't want it to... Uh, ISIS is a product of a very unique set of circumstances. So we could say uh, it has Salafist roots to a certain extent in terms of aspect of its thought, but I think it would be unfair to all of the hardworking, sincere Muslims who will call themselves Salafi, but they're totally in disagreement with ISIS and doesn't support ISIS in any way, shape, or form. So I wouldn't make that sort of blanket uh, association uh, in the interest of fairness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so going, going back in time here, so you, you make the acquaintance of, of Hamza Yusuf. And right, and this is the, yeah, around 93, 94 at the Muslim powwow in New Mexico. And you said his, his reputation already preceded him. A little bit. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm thinking 93. Right. I don't know how much he is on the national stage. Exactly. Because but he's emerging. I met him and, yeah. and heard some things at the mass conference. Right. But as soon as I leave, you know, I forget those things. Right. This is before things. the... Yeah. No, they were good things. Oh, good things. He okay. was there as a guest oh, speaker. Oh, I, I see. I thought you were talking about, like, the, oh, he's a suit, like, that, that, well, that. Well, that was through another okay. <laughs> set right, of right. things. That's the residue from the okay. Salafi involvement. But in the context of the conference, he's their guest speaker, and he's coming from here, Santa Clara. Correct. Ironically, we're here, so he's the Imam of Masjid and Nur, the mm -hmm. Khatib at MCA, so which are very much in that direction. Uh, yeah, exactly. And and those uh, institutions at that time were under the sway of kind of 
Khwani, Salafish. Proto Marxist, yeah, yeah. Group. I wouldn't say Marxist in any way, shape, or form. Not the organizations, I mean the underpinnings the of, thought. say, the Brotherhood. Okay. Yeah, so, sorry. in any case, so they're associated with mass, so he's the guest mm-hmm. speaker, there, so people are saying good things, yeah, they're yeah. listening, they're amazed. Uh, and then time hasn't, and stature, the stature isn't there yet for yeah. people to be jealous or petty to really start any sort of hard hitting yes. campaigns or slanders or scandals. So at that point, uh, it's just my own, the Muslim power itself and the location. And then the group that had been uh, dominant there for some time, their association with Sufism, mm-hmm. which uh, Nurdin Durki and the Shadali Tariqa that he had affiliated with being associated with ABQ. ABQ. So, yeah, it's, a compl- it's an interesting story. ABQ itself, that whole. I hope I make it sound as complicated as it is. <laughs> With these well, it's funny because we were talking about 1974. There's a lot of overlaps. There's there's a lot of things happening. It's a formative period. It really is. If you look at the Ummah itself, in that formative period, you have so many ideas. You look at Imam Ashari, Maqalat Islamiyin. The you have the good, the bad, the ugly. You think we have some strange versions of Islam? You you just all kinds of wacky stuff. That's right. That's right. So no, I was going back to the early 90s. Uh, and you know, we joked about 1974 being the year I was born, the year you graduated from high school. 19, I remember 1993, 94, uh, at the ISNA convention is where I first encounter, uh, at that time, Imam Hamza Yusuf, this young imam who had just returned from studying abroad and now was an imam in Santa Clara. And he was, um, yeah, featured on a panel. And I think that's where I remember him kind of hitting his, uh, you know, the, the trajectory started beginning. Was well, on the, the, rise. the famous yeah. Council on Foreign Relations. Yes, piece, the yes. Cafe <laughs> <Ara>. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And then I remember, and this is this is again just a distinct memory of mine. By ninety four, ninety three, you know, again, one could certainly see that he was of he was on the national scene as as was Imam Zaid emerging ninety four, ninety five in terms of being on the ISNA panels and so on. I remember meeting Sheikh Hamza oh, Yusuf. Oh, yeah, and at that point I wasn't, I was more regional and not on well, the Well, no, no, but I remember you were, no, this is the, the story. So, 94 Isna, uh, or 95 Isna, uh, I, I bump into Sheikh Hamza Yusuf at the, uh, at that time, uh, what was the name of the, uh, he used to sell cassettes, um, the, uh, the Alhambra production. Right, 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 right. And he was like, have you heard of Imam Zaid Shakar? That's what he asked me. And at that time, I hadn't heard of Imam Zaid Shakir. And he said, well, he said, he's here and he has cassettes. I think you, you, had, a, you had a booth in yeah, the bazaar. Yeah. He said, go and you got to buy cassettes from Imam Zaid Shakir. What are, what are Shakir. cassettes? I, I Sorry? Just, what, are Sorry cassettes? What, what are cassettes? Cassettes are little things with a tape inside of it. <laughs> a spooling yeah. Yeah. piece of plastic. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, which babies can easily pull out. Right. Um, yeah. So... Um, and, and I remember going to your booth and picking up a few cassettes. And uh, so, yeah, that's uh, really, I think, yeah, 95 is now. Yeah. Right. So, so, you have, you, but, so your paths have well, crossed. We had the two yeah, yeah. Muslim powwows now. That's right. You've already had two Muslim So, so now I understand. <laughs> Some rapper schmo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now I'm off to Syria. Yes. So 1994, you... right after that second Muslim powwow. Uh huh. Had a family reunion in Long Beach. I went to visit my mother-in-law in Hawaii, and then I flew off to Syria. Okay. Yeah. So you spent how long in Syria? I spent uh, six years. At Damascus University? You were at Damascus I was in, at the, uh, no, what they the call Dar- Kulia to Dao to the Islamia, Dao the Islamic Dawah College at right. Rukn mm-hmm. at Abi Noor, and wonder. then I was doing some private lessons, primarily with Sheikh Mustafa Turkmen. Okay. In uh, Zahra, a neighborhood called Zahra Qadima. Mm. Mm. So, so from about ninety-five to two thousand one, you're in Syria. Exactly ninety-four to two thousand one. Okay. Okay. Well, I took a year off and I went to Morocco. Mm. Because if you weren't in the country, you didn't have to go to classes to maintain your residency visa mm. in Syria. So you weren't here for September. I mean, you know. It's no, it happened. I, I was back in Syria. Mm. I had been in Morocco. Yeah. I went back to Syria for exams. Okay. So if you, if you were out of the country, you just had to come back to take the exams. Okay. 
So I figured it would be more profitable to go somewhere else to study something else. So I went to Morocco and just go back to Syria. They had the mid-year exams and the end-of-the-year exams. Now, but by, by that time, late 90s, early 2000s, you're definitely at the ISNA convention, and you're speaking on the national platform there. Uh, yeah. It's possible. 97. I remember seeing you. I yeah. remember seeing you. 97, yeah, 98. On here. the side panels. No, 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 no. no, no, no. Uh, what I define is not prime time, Saturday night or okay, Friday night. whatever. It's all a blur. Just saying. I just no, sit down right. and take notes. And, what was I doing? <laughs> Okay. So in any case, so, you, so you're you're overseas yeah. when when 9/11 happened. Exactly. I was actually, I had to take two because I was going back and forth. Uh, I would come back and cram for the exams. Mm-hmm. So I actually I failed two exams because we had like 15 exams in 15 days. It was like an exam a day, one after the other. Right. And I hadn't been following all year, so I, I failed the inheritance law. So I had to retake it. That's a tough one. And uh, so you retake it in the fall. Mm. So otherwise, uh, that summer I would have been done, but I had to redo the inheritance law. Then there was another uh, class, like, it was just so confusing that uh, it just wasn't well taught. It was teaching methodology. Many students, not most, many students didn't pass that. So I had to redo that one. Mm. And so... I, I I had went to the States for a visit, and then I came back. In fact, I went to the States for the, the Dean Intensive that was in Hayward, right here in California. And then I went back to Syria after that to study for those two exams. Mm. And so my regimen was a lot. I have the imam because they generally lock the masjids except the more touristic ones like Jamal Amawi stays open all day. Mm-hmm. But the smaller neighborhood masjids, they lock up between the prayers. And so that's the perfect place to study Sunday, because right. no one could bother you. So after Fajr, I just have the imam lock me in and, until Buhr and from Buhr until Asr. And I would be alone in the masjid all day just cramming. And so I'm in there studying, and so some of the kids, they're banging on the door. Boom, 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 boom. Sheikh Zaid, Sheikh Zaid. Fi, yani, harb fi Amerika, gharha ala Amerika, fa qasafa bayt al-abyad, wa al-barj fi New York, wa Congress, wa just the, wa bayt al-abyad is like, they, they attack the White House and Congress and the towers and, it was like, I said, what, what? And so I said, go get the imam, have him let me out. <laughs> so they had to go get the imam, and he unlocked the chains. And So I never watched television in Syria, even though we had a satellite hookup. I just studied, and yeah. I just didn't watch television. So we went, and we hooked up the television satellite thing, and we finally got it going, and here's CNN, and the t- one of the towers is smoking, and... Mm-hmm. They have commentary by Tom Clancy of all people. Right. Yeah. You remember that? I remember that. And that's him, Tom, because he wrote written a novel about the planes crashing into yeah. Tom, is this a case of life imitating art? And you know, this is asinine questions. And then the banner, Osama bin Laden, and I like how they know that at this point. Mm-hmm. Makes you wonder. Uh, so it was. It was that happened. Students were all met to discuss the situation and what we should do and how we should approach this. So, yeah, I was there. Mm-hmm. And so I came back. So I took the test. I passed. And so I was done. So I came back to the states. I, I left uh, uh, Syria by bus for uh, Umrah. Mm-hmm. So we stopped in Medina for Ziara. Went on to. Mecca for the Umrah and that order because we're traveling from the north from Syria flew to Egypt to buy books for a couple of days at the uh, old bookstore there oh, yeah. near Azhar that's right al Bab al Halabi and then uh, flew to Morocco because I spent the year on well about eight months in Morocco the previous year so I had a lot of friends and visited there and uh, then to England, 
because uh, there was we had contacts. Usually when I went back, we stopped in England, okay. do a few talks and things. Then we came to America, and so it was early November, and uh, it was just, it was weird. The airport was almost empty, mm. totally empty, mm -hmm. even at that point. We go in the parking lot, all these cars, the antennas had these beat-up American flags, because the post 9-11 affirmation of your patriotism, you put the flag on your car antenna, and now it's early November. So, so it's already a little weathered. Exactly, these raggedy, it was like, too, too much. it was surreal, yeah, yeah. really. Yeah. And we're in the parking lot and we're like looking at all these flags and so yeah. you got a rental car. That, that paradigm to shift that you must have experienced, I mean, that's, that's you know, really profound because I think... Yeah. For you know, those most of us. Of it just kind of happened around yeah. us. Yeah. Whereas right. for you, it was like yeah, it was like this when you left, and it was like this when you came back. Yeah, correct. Yeah, it was it was interesting. So now, then you're settled. You're you're, you're settling by uh, settling back into life in Connecticut, uh, and then the call comes to move out west. Well, I don't think the call came. That was very interesting. Uh -huh. Like the community. How did that happen? Yeah. First of all, you know, during my absence of those seven years, uh, the community was transformed. Uh, there were a lot of, uh, you know, we were able to keep things in balance. Okay. But when, when I left, there were some imbalances and there was power grabs. And so the harmony that really allowed for a very dynamic community uh, just was gone. Okay. And so, uh, for me, it was a very uh, sad, frustrating, difficult situation. Yeah. So, I, I, I had met, uh, when I was in Hawaii, uh, one of the years in Syria, I got really sick. So, I went, my mother-in-law lives in Hawaii. So, okay. I went to Hawaii to recover. And so, I became the imam there for like six months. <laughs> and I had, a real, I had a real bad case of bronchitis. And uh, so I made some connections there. One of my friends there had moved to Dallas, uh, Texas, Richardson Masjid. Of course. And so he was calling me to come there. That Dr. Yusuf was looking for an assistant, and because he was phasing out. Yes. And so I, I actually was on. I went through all the interviews. They had literally hired me. I think I had so even called the contract. This is just rumor because I. So I'm in Houston. I'm right. from Houston. So we had heard rumors. That Imam Zaid was going to be accepting a position at the Richardson that's, Masjid. That's absolutely true. <laughs> okay, I'm getting verification. This is fascinating. It's absolutely true. We were so excited living in again because it was and only four uh, hours away and we could go in here and Imam and Zaid. So, in any case, yeah. uh, sorry. I'm so, a fanboy moment. Yeah. <laughs> so, then uh, I, 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 to this day, I cannot tell you exactly how I ended up at Zaytuna. It's just that. You know, I heard that Sheikh Hamza was like on the road, he's doing all this damage control post 9 11, things are falling apart. Sheikh Salik had come there for medical attention, but he, his, his, his health doesn't allow him to teach too much. And mm. So just one thing led to another, and bam, there I was in Zaytuna. And, uh, it's mm -hmm. funny for our listeners, you know, so many of these stories are now interject. Like, are, we've had yeah. enough guests on, and we've had enough, you know, where a lot of these stories are now converging. Uh, like, people have, people have heard me talk about hearing Sheikh Hamza for the first time at Isna. But at the same time, the audience has heard Mustafa Davis's story, where he mentions Imam Zaid picking him, picking him up from the airport in Damascus and taking him around. And then we've heard, we've heard, we've had Osama Kanan on talk about his himself as a student and prodigy of you know Imam Zaid and Sheikh Hamza so it's yeah, funny it's, all these stories are now coming it's, together it's so. fascinating I but uh, so then it, so it happens though uh, how it, it does happens, happen yeah, and you're and here I think uh, Dr. Yusuf has never forgiven Sheikh Hamza not me because <laughs> according to Dr. Yusuf Sheikh Hamza took me away <laughs> from him Right. And it just, it's on me, Dr. Yusuf, if you're listening. Right. He was a, he's, it was he's this, a beautiful person. Kata, he is, and he I, I was actually really world. looking forward to that. And But, you know. We would have loved it, but. Uh, Qadr Allah right. I ended up here, and look where we end up now today, last and night. I, I'm living here, and I'm spe I'm sitting across the table from Imam Zaid in Santa Clara, so. And so that whole, whole move that happens, yeah. and. 
So I, I started teaching there yes. various things. At one point, literally, I was teaching 15 classes wow. a week. Wow. This is the former, this is Aetuna Institute. And then when we know. started the seminary program, right. I was teaching like the whole curriculum, mm -hmm. everything. So, uh, and then we had evening classes. So we had those classes, evening classes, weekend classes. Uh, so yeah, and then uh, the next year we brought uh, Sheikh Yahya Rodas, and so he taught. And then the next year we brought uh, uh, Imam uh, uh, Sheikh uh, Abdurrahman Tahir from San Jose, Somali Sheikh, Rahimahullah. He passed away. Okay. And he used to every week he would be at Tatlif, where you are now. And, and so, and then the fourth year we brought uh, Sheikh Abdul Ali. So that's how he got out here, was through that program. And then after that, that we had the strategic planning session. After that year, we're assessing the four years of that pilot program okay. with uh, John Myrna from Myrna Associates, a okay. really top-notch strategic planner, uh, facilitator, planning facilitator. So we had the strategic planning session, and out of that it became clear we wanted to do a college, not a seminary, uh, because so people's degrees could be recognized, and it would be an undergraduate program. Most seminaries are graduate programs. And then, uh, so that was 2007. 2008, we started the Summer Arabic Intensive just as a way to see our ability to manage a college level program that was really the roots of the uh, summer Arabic intensive and then uh, from there uh, 2010 we opened the doors of the college and the rest is history mm -hmm. last year 2014 first graduating class and now 2015 fifth year in uh, initial accreditation right it's uh, pretty amazing it really is yeah so now uh, we've come sort of full circle we, we back have, to where we yeah. started. Uh, now let's kind of move beyond, like in terms of uh, sort of maybe ending with uh, where, where do you see what's five years down the road? What's ten years down the road, inshallah, looking like for, Z for Zaytuna? I, I, would, I would hope and pray that five, ten years down the road, let's say five, because we've done actually a, a five-year strategic planning session. Okay. We're looking at uh, about... 100, 110 students, okay. inshallah ta'ala. We're looking at uh, uh, the buildings, the two buildings that we've been able to obtain in Berkeley being fully renovated. Okay. Really beautiful, very inviting spaces. You, yeah. We're Great. looking at uh, possibly a master's and PhD program in conjunction with the Graduate Theological Union. Okay. Uh, we're looking at uh, inshallah ta'ala if Allah wills we're looking at uh, a, a really I think now we have a really stellar factory fac faculty we're really a world class faculty we're looking at an endowment of about 50 million dollars inshallah and those are the goals and those are the things we need to really sustain ourselves uh, so those are and we're looking at Zaytuna really being on the map as one of the premier if not the premier liberal arts college in this country, mm. by the help, of the grace, the permission, and the tawfiq, mm. the provenance and facilitation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, and, and just sort of as, as I think, again, we, we've, wound, we've wound right back to, to the beginning of our journey. And that was not intentional, but it, it, it worked out rather well. Allah uh, brings you back to where you started. Mm. Wherever you are, Allah will bring you all together. <laughs> um, it, beyond uh, Zaytuna College, can you can you talk about uh, some of the, if you will, the extracurricular stuff that, that you do while, while in the Bay Area? And, and uh, kind of sort of a camel backing on that, I'd be, I would be remiss, you know, and, and, and have my Tatlif bona fides revoked if I don't talk about uh, your involvement. <laughs> you are the chairman of the board at, at Tatlif. Uh, maybe from your vantage point, you know, where does Tatlif begin and, and you know, where that... Uh, Tatlif is a part, and so, as you said, it's all related. When we had that strategic planning session with John Myrna, uh -huh. 
uh, one of the things that we identified was scope creep that Zaytuna Institute has a Quran school on the Carter Omar and sister Rumana Abdullah, Nigerian sister. Zaytuna Institute has Dawan outreach under Sidi Usama Kenan. Zaytuna Institute has a prison program under Rami Ansur and and uh, and Sari Greenwell. Zaytuna Institute has this program and that program, and and uh, it was clear that if we're going to be a college, we have to. It's such a momentous undertaking. It's such a, especially in light of the just the the fiscal demands, the human resource demands, that to do all of these other things, uh, it just wasn't going to happen. And so those things were spun off. Hmm. Okay. And the Dawa and outreach spin off, that becomes Tadif. Hmm. And so starting in the back of uh, Sidi Usama Cannon's house, right. on Sylvan Avenue in Hayward, a uh, space that was maybe 50 square feet, very small. You could barely get uh, the office uh, furniture from the Zaytuna office over into that space. And then the, from there to Fremont and the, uh, the rented space downstairs and from there to the warehouse space subsequently renovated in uh, southern Fremont. So that's that leaf mm. and where it fits in <laughs> all of this. Well, and and um, do, are, are there venues online where people can, can find you in terms of your writings and things like that? Sir? Right. I have a, a website, New Islamic Directions, Facebook, Imam Zayshakir, primarily. So you're, you're not hard to find, inshallah. People, not people. hard to find. You do a Google search, you'll find the good, the bad, the ugly. <laughs> the bad and ugly, ignore, <laughs> because it's from bad and ugly people. Yeah, that's right. And the good, praise Allah and ask for an increase. Mm. That's right. And uh, we I really, I mean, from the bottom of our hearts, so we can't thank you enough. I mean, you've just come back from a being on the road for several Months doing the yeah, a couple strong. more to go. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, Ramadan. Okay. Oh my gosh. Okay. Wow, yeah. Ramadan. I'll be nice back nice. here. I'm leaving Wednesday for Orlando, Florida, and then several other things, and then uh, April. I'll be back here in April, okay. pretty much. But in two weeks, I'm going to uh, visit my mother-in-law in Hawaii. Nice. Take a Hopefully, break. that'll be a nice little break. Yeah. Yeah, and then so we'll be pretty much. Okay grinding it out until Ramadan. Then Ramadan, I'm shutting it down. Usually in Ramadan, I don't travel. Yeah. Well, last Ramadan was all travel <laughs> for the 12,000 thing. We did like 29 cities in 30 days. That's right. And then flew to Houston for Eid. It was funny. I, and again, I, I, I'm not, I don't mean to like selfishly interject myself here, but you, you started, I remember, Ramadan at the Lighthouse Mosque here in Oakland. That's and then right. you ended it with Eid. And I celebrated both with you on the lot because I was at, I was in I was at Eid for it, or I was in for Eid, yeah. So wow, yeah. Mashallah. <laughs> well, th but, thank yeah. you again yeah. for for coming and ch chatting with us. I mean, this is uh, I mean, wish we could talk some more. I mean, there's there's a plenty yeah. plenty more narrative, but uh, we appreciate getting your take on. Alhamdulillah. Allah barik fikum. Allah taala reward. Thank you. You guys for this for wonderful wonderful eff effort, and may it continue to grow, reach a lot of people. Thank and you. be a source of education, enlightenment, and uh, uh, a tool to dispel the thickening clouds of ignorance that are descending over our society. I mean, we try. Alhamdulillah. Thank. Salam alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, so so big big thanks to Imam Zaid for taking the time to chat with us. Like I said, I mean, a, a big part of why we started doing the show was to. Uh, share the 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 narrative the american muslim narrative and just the the complexities of it and and just what a rich tapestry it is and i think what you uh, the listeners are hopefully seeing after having listened to a few of these is the intersections as these as the narratives are being fleshed out and we're seeing 
this is the the story from Osama Kana's perspective, mm-hmm. and then this is the, the the piece of the story from Imam Zaid's perspective, and you know that's really a long term goal of ours. Ideal is to create this this oral history of of not just Islam in the Bay Area. Although, I mean that's kind of been a, <laughs> an inadvertent focus, I guess. But, yeah. but ideally, uh, Islam in America. Although I think if if we I don't know what we're, this is episode eighteen. I think if we actually do the math, we've had more guests outside of the Bay Area than local. That's but, true. Uh, uh, or somewhere close to more than fifty percent have been not lo- not non local guests, uh, and in, and and not in any way to sort of take away from any of the other guests we've had or any of the shows we've done in the past. Because like Zaki has said, all been remarkable and have just really been an amazing journey to get us to where we are. But you know, for those who listen to this episode, you know, there were moments where I sort of get into fanboy mode and, and and this is probably the first time that that's happened but really Imam Zaid has had an indelible impact on me personally and my own sort of you know growth and development and you know coming into my own as it were uh, in my Muslim skin and, and 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 where I am with my with my faith that I couldn't help but have those moments of sort of fanboying well, out, I think so. I think in that sense you're kind of a surrogate for many people in the audience. I hope so I, I hope I'm so guessing. and well deserved in terms of uh, those who uh, yeah, yeah, I have high praise for Imam Said. So yeah, it was really an honor to have him on. Um, but uh, well, and and I mean, and, uh, as I, one thing I always say is is uh, we really appreciate the feedback that we get, not only in terms of email that we receive at diffusecongruence at gmail dot com, but also via our Facebook page, which is facebook dot com slash diffusecongruence, and also via iTunes uh, and Stitcher Radio. And, and I just wanted to share some new reviews that have been posted on iTunes. And uh, this is from Go Rockets. Uh, I'm guessing that is Hakeem Olajuwon. That who, who wrote this. That's, right. that's, that's what I choose to I choose to <laughs> believe that. It says, "Thank you for broadcasting some of the complexities of Islam in America. These podcasts reveal a depth that is often lost in mass media these days. Good work, and I look forward to your future episodes. I'm hooked." Yay! I, I, yeah, I, I don't know who Go Rockets is, but uh, being from Houston, I hope. Uh, it's someone that uh, uh, thank you for listening, whoever you are, and uh, thank, uh, hope you continue listening. Well, and this is from speaking of Hakeem Olajuwon, you know, and the wish list. I'd love to have him there on you the go. show. So, 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 so Hakeem, <laughs> hook us up, whoever you, Hakeem, or, or should I say, go Rockets? <laughs> That's right. We'd love to have you. We'd love to have him. Uh, and this is from Salome thirty eight. And uh, they say, a profound contribution on so many levels. I'm a researcher, and these oral histories have been wonderfully rewarding. Kudos and many thanks. So that that's that's pretty awesome. Thank, thank you for that. That's uh, The fact that uh, you're responding in that way to yeah. what we're deliberately setting out to do, that's very gratifying. Yeah. So uh, with that, uh, Pervez, uh, uh, do you have any final words for this episode? No, I mean, I didn't think we, you know, we, we said it uh, uh, early on, but uh, yeah, no, thank you for continuing to listen and the feedback and support you send us. Uh, and uh, we hope to continue to bring unique and new personalities uh, to the show. And, you know, we hope to do that. Uh, please do, as Zaki said, send us your feedback. Continue doing so. Engage us, whether it's via Facebook or uh, um, or on uh, at, at uh, diffusecongruence at gmail dot com. Um, you can find Zaki online. You can find me online. And um, thank you. And uh, yeah, if, if you're looking to reach out to us, I'm on Twitter. I'm at Zaki's Corner at Z A K I S Corner, and uh, I, that's also my website, Z A K I S Corner. I'm also at the Huffington Post, where my movie reviews go up regularly, as does this. Podcast. Oh, you know, I'd be I'd be remiss as your as your co-host not to mention the fact that since our last podcast, uh, Zucky has been uh, is the most recent inductee into the uh, San Francisco uh, Critics Circle. Uh, sorry, what's the proper? I'm sorry. The, the San Francisco Film Critics it's Circle. Prestigious, yeah. yeah, it's pre- prestigious nonetheless. So, congratulations to Zucky, and uh, we wish him all the best in that endeavor. Well, thank you. Thank you. And yeah, and like I said, if, you, if you're interested in checking out what I do when I'm not doing this, now you know how. <laughs> and with that, uh, that brings us close to another episode, and we look forward to hearing from you, and hopefully you look forward to hearing from us next month. Take care.